Good morning and welcome to the 23rd annual Metro Children's Water Festival. My name is Paula Leopold and I am a member of the planning committee for the Children's Water Festival. And um, we have done a lot of work to put together a festival online versus, um, versus in person at the usually held the last Wednesday of every September at the Minnesota State Fairgrounds. So we'll just have another minute or so and then we'll as some people, more people are joining in and we'll be able to start our presentation today. Good morning and welcome to the 23rd annual Metro Children's Water Festival. So different for us to have a festival online this year, but we're very glad to be able to provide that for students and teachers as well. So um, again, uh, this morning, our first class of the day is uh, Journey Through a Watershed from Forest to Faucet. And Terry Heyer from the USDA Forest Service is going to be our presenter today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Terry. Hi everybody, good morning. My name is Terry Heyer and I work for the US Forest Service. The Forest Service is part of the federal government and our job is to take care of our trees, woods and forests all over the country, but especially our 155 national forests. I call them your really big backyard. We have two national forests in Minnesota, the Superior in the Northeastern part of the state and the Chippewa in the north central part of the state. We are going to learn today about where our water comes from. Yes, it comes from the, from the faucet, but where does it start? It starts in the forest, in small streams and seeps in the forest. I live in St. Paul, and the, my drinking water comes from the Mississippi River, and that starts out in Itasca State Park, which is full of forests and wetlands that produced very clean water. We, are also, we will also see today some amazing things that live in these small streams in the forest, including the hellbender, which is a really big aquatic salamander. I hope you enjoy this Forest to the Faucet video and have fun learning about where our water starts out from my friends Della and Amchat. Thank you. studied hard for them, so cross my fingers that they're good. <laughs> okay, I'm done showing you guys how it's done on the court. I'm thirsty. Me too. Let's have some water. Ew. I don't drink water from the fountain. Bottled water is better. What makes you think bottled is better? This water is cool, clean, and fresh. It tastes great, and I don't have to throw away all those plastic bottles. Are you sure that water is really okay to drink? Yeah. My family and I went on a nature hike in the mountains last month, and a ranger there told us all about the watershed. The water what? Yeah, what's a watershed? Well, come here. I'll show you. 
See, the watershed starts from the top of the mountain, and then all the water from the lakes and streams flow to the city. And that's how we get our water here. Cool, but how does the water flow down to us in the city? Well, let's take a what our ranger said, and then you'll know all about watersheds. Whoa, that was a quick trip to the top of the watershed. Hi, I'm Jet. Della, back so soon? Yes, I was just telling my friends about watersheds, and since you work for the U.S. Forest Service, I thought you'd be a perfect person to show us around. Sure, I'd love to. I'm very proud to be a part of the U.S. Forest Service and to continue our 110-year legacy of managing lands for multiple uses in ways that provide clean, fresh water for us, and for future generations. So, let's start here. We're at the very top of the Catskill Mountains. This is where our water starts its journey, down to that fountain in New York City. Before we explain about watersheds, maybe we should talk about fresh water. What's so special about fresh water? All right, great question. If you looked at Earth from outer space, it's mostly a blue planet. And that's because roughly two thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And the human body is approximately three quarters water. Water is life, and it's vital for the survival of all humans, plants, and animals on the planet. It's part of what distinguishes the living planet from one without signs of life. There's a big difference between fresh water and salt water. As abundant as it is, you can't drink ocean water, which has high concentrations of salt. Just a tiny percentage is fresh water, only 3%. And much of that fresh water is stored in the form of ice, as glaciers, ice caps, and snow. The remaining fresh water must be shared by the Earth's seven billion people for drinking and other household uses, as well as industry, agriculture, and recreation. So what you're saying is we've got lots of water on this planet, but we can't drink it all? That's right. And now that we know the importance of fresh water and how scarce it really is, let's talk about watersheds. What is a watershed? Well, I learned that a watershed is an area of land where all the water that falls on it or moves under it drains to the same place. That includes all of the rainfall, streams, and groundwater heading to a common area, such as a river, lake, reservoir, or even the sea. So you can think of a watershed as a bathtub, where all of the water drains down to the same point. It's kind of like that, just a gigantic and oddly shaped bathtub with earthen walls. It's important to remember that water, because of gravity, is always trying to make its way down to the lowest point. Water will go over, under, around, or through anything in its path as it moves downward. See, when I was here before, we looked at a map of the mountain ridges and hills around here, and at the very top, water either goes one way or another. The ridges and hills that separate two watersheds are called the drainage divide. Yeah, let's take it one step further. The watersheds for New York City are part of the larger watersheds of the Hudson and Delaware rivers. These two rivers contain lots of smaller watersheds. All right, check this out. I grew up playing in a little place called Sligo Creek. Now, that creek watershed feeds into a larger body called the Anacostia River. The Anacostia then joins into the even larger Potomac River, which then feeds into the Chesapeake Bay, ultimately flowing out into the Atlantic Ocean. So at any point in my childhood, I was in the Chesapeake Bay watershed because I was in one of the smaller watersheds that ultimately flow there. The Chesapeake Bay watershed is gigantic, covering six states and the District of Columbia. Everybody lives in a watershed, and it's called your watershed address. You can find it on the Environmental Protection Agency's website, Surf Your Watershed. Put in your zip code or city name. You'll see the name and number of the stream and river that makes up your watershed address. If a drop of water falls on your street or lawn, this is where it goes. So this little trickle of water will join lots of other trickles that become streams and rivers and eventually provide gallons of clean water to millions of people in the New York City area. This is so cool. The water that oozes out of here is called a seep. Seeps are places where groundwater comes to the surface and they're actually common through the Catskill Mountains. Seeps are important because they help maintain stream levels during dry times of the year. Forests are vital in the protection of water as it moves through the ecosystem. Forests do three things. They act like a sponge, a filter, and an umbrella. That's right, exactly. 
First, trees and other plants capture runoff from heavy rains by absorbing the water, like a sponge, which reduces soil erosion, traps sediments, and keeps water in the forest for plants and animals. Trees and other plants protect the earth by acting like an umbrella, so that the soil doesn't all just wash away when it rains. Now, those roots underground both absorb water and hold the soil in place, further minimizing the effects of erosion. Forests and green spaces are also like gigantic filters, since they trap sediments and pollutants that might be moving through the watershed from upstream. Now, this goes a long way towards keeping water in the forest for use by plants and animals. Della, did you know that a large oak tree can drink up to 40,000 gallons of water a year? So people can have a hard time understanding how forests make water available when trees use so much. Yeah, I remember. The trees and plants of the forest absorb rainfall through their roots and release that water slowly as vapor through their leaves. That's called evapotranspiration. Through evapotranspiration, water is released into the atmosphere and the water cycle continues. Forests keep humidity levels high, which makes water available for other plants in the area. So water hangs around longer like it would in a sponge, rather than just flowing away as surface water. Water is one of the most important natural resources coming from forests. About one-fifth of the nation's water originates from 193 million acres of land managed by the U.S. Forest Service for the public good. That's a lot of acres of land. Has the Forest Service always managed U.S. forests? Well, not exactly. If you flash back to the 18th and 19th centuries, lots of forests were cut on a massive scale to provide wood for our growing country. People weren't really thinking about the future, and they thought we had an endless supply of wood. Trees were cut to build railroads, buildings, bridges, and other things. We didn't know the repercussions of so much cutting. Without healthy, intact forests, rivers clogged with silt, stream banks eroded, landslides developed, and water became polluted. Lots of dry, woody material was left on the land, and it was easily ignited by lightning or a stray match. As a result, there were massive wildfires. Legislation was passed in the early 1900s to allow the federal government to manage public lands for the benefit of everyone and to allow multiple uses of its resources. Congress established the Forest Service in 1905 to maintain a sustainable supply of water and timber for the nation, thanks to then-President Theodore Roosevelt and his forester friend Gifford Pinchot. Protecting healthy, resilient forests and grasslands is more cost-effective than paying to build water purification plants and flood control structures, for example. Forest Service lands and other public and private lands are managed as working forests and grasslands that contribute to the delivery of plenty of pure, clean water for everyone. In 1910, the largest fire in U.S. history blazed through the West and burned three million acres in just two days. It was named the Big Burn, and it is known as the fire that prompted the U.S. government to fully support the Forest Service and really pay attention to how forests are managed. That's quite a history. Making sure we always have a good supply of clean water was important 100 years ago. It's important today, and it will always be important for the future, too. What does the Forest Service focus on these days? The Forest Service focuses on maintaining and improving the health, diversity, and productivity of forest ecosystems for the enjoyment of current and future generations. The Forest Service works closely with state foresters, private landowners, and educators to help people understand the best management practices for natural resources. Forests are fun places for fishing, snorkeling, boating, hiking, and camping. So we get recreation, wood, wildlife habitat, and water from forests. I understand that not everyone gets their water from areas that are national forests, state forests, or even private forests, right? Yep. Some people get their water from wells or lakes and rivers, but we all live in a watershed. Water connects everything. Like the saying goes, everyone lives downstream. People draw boundaries between states and privately owned land or publicly owned land, but water just flows downhill. So, speaking of, let's see where this water's going. Awesome, I'm always ready for an adventure. All those trickles of water have collected and now we have a small stream. Yeah, we've moved downstream a bit, but you can see that we're still under this nice, wonderful forest canopy here, right? 
Okay, I've got a riddle for you. A riddle? Really? All right, bring yes. it on. So, what's as new as a dewdrop, but as old as the earth? Hmm. Okay, I've got another clue. What can make itself new over and over again? I know where you're going with this one. The water cycle. That's right. All right, so I know you've learned a bit about the water cycle, so why don't you give us a tour? Okay. You may think that every drop of rain that falls from the sky or each glass of water that you drink is brand new, but it's always been here, and it is a part of the water cycle. The water cycle describes how water moves around the earth then changes form as liquid water, ice, or gas. Life on, in, and above the Earth depends on the water cycle. The heat of the sun provides energy to make the water cycle work. The sun evaporates water from the oceans into the water vapor. This invisible vapor rises into the atmosphere, where the air is colder. The water vapor condenses into clouds. Air currents move clouds all around the Earth. Water drops form in clouds, and the drops then fall to the Earth as precipitation, such as rain and snow. In cold climates, precipitation builds up as snow, ice, and glaciers. Snow can melt and become runoff, which flows into rivers, the oceans, and into the ground. Some rain soaks into the ground as infiltration and recharges groundwater. Rainfall on land flows downhill as runoff, providing water to lakes, rivers, and oceans. Water from lakes and rivers can also seep into the ground. Water moves underground because of gravity and pressure. Some ice evaporates directly into the air, skipping the melting phase. This is known as sublimation. Groundwater close to the land surface is taken up by plants. Some groundwater seeps into rivers and the lakes and can flow to the surface as springs. Plants take up groundwater and the evapotranspire, or evaporate it, from their leaves. Some groundwater goes very deep into the ground and stays there for a long time. Groundwater flows into the oceans, keeping the water cycle going. Thanks for that explanation, Della. We talked earlier about how forests help keep water clean and plentiful, but what are the indicators for a healthy watershed? Now, when watersheds are healthy and functioning well, they provide clean water, food, and habitat for native plants and animals. A healthy watershed has the right amount of vegetation to capture, purify, and store water, which allows its gradual release into streams that, in turn, reduces the risk of flooding and erosion. Healthy forest ecosystems and watersheds even affect air quality by absorbing pollutants and greenhouse gases. So, Della, a healthy watershed has a few key components. What are they? Well, it has to have vegetation on the banks, not only to help prevent runoff, but to also keep water cool. Yep. And a good flow of water. Mm-hmm. Waterways should be open so that fish and other aquatic organisms can move upstream or downstream. In other words, there shouldn't be human-made structures that block the waterway. That's a good one. The water at the bottom of the watershed should be as clean as it is at the top. People should minimize the use of chemicals and other pollutants that enter the stream. Absolutely. In a healthy watershed, people care and get involved. There might be people doing education or managing the stream, picking up trash, planting trees, or even helping other ways to help keep the watershed healthy from start to finish. Yeah, I really like that one. And lastly, another factor to consider is whether the watershed has indicator species. Now, indicator species, that's a good one. Let's define that a bit. Well, the textbook definition is an organism whose presence, absence, or abundance reflects in a specific environmental condition. Yeah, but come on, you can do this one in your own words. Okay, well, that basically means that if you can find certain sensitive organisms in the water, Mm -hmm. then the watershed is healthy, and if you can't find them, then there's probably a problem. Let's take a look at some of the small critters that you can find in a healthy watershed. Here at the Aquaquan Wildlife Refuge, the students are able to net for macro invertebrates and test the water quality. It's eight. We're mixing it until the tablet is disintegrated, and then we're going to wait five minutes. Other scientists before us have come out and determined some animals to be pollution tolerant. That means they can live all day in polluted waters and be just fine. If you only find that kind of animal, what does that tell you? It's yeah, the water is probably polluted. On the other hand, some animals are pollution intolerant or pollution sensitive, meaning if they are in polluted waters, they will not be able to survive. So if we find some pollution sensitive animals, what does that tell us? They're exactly right. So we can use what animals we find in order to infer what uh, the health of the watershed is. It looks like a shrimp. It is a shrimp, it's well a identified. Sh- well, it's a shrimp? <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. There's a dragonfly eating another one. They're predators. 
Here, I'll maybe put this back. Maybe it's a baby one of the stone flies. So what was this one? That, that one? There you go. So that's... Um, I think that's a water stone name. It might be a rifle beetle. Hey, this, this water is really clean because we're finding all these macro invertebrates. Really interesting organisms, right? Yes, and I hear there's a very cool salamander in some Appalachian streams that serves as an indicator species for quality there. Yes, you're thinking about the hellbender salamander. Now, Della, you've already seen this one, mm -hmm. but let's let everybody else watch. Seriously, just watch. For the most part, you're not going to see them. I mean, even though they're these giant salamanders, they blend right in with the bottom of the water. Their skin just blends right in, and their body shape allows them to, to get in these spaces under their rocks. People may never see them, but in healthy rivers, they may be there, and they probably are there. It's part of a healthy ecosystem. It's part of a healthy river system. Look at that. Of course, we're the hot spot for, for salamanders in the world, and our rivers and streams have some of the highest fish, crayfish, freshwater mussel diversity as well, and certainly some of the best hellbender populations remaining. Different types of rocks provide cover, places for food, places to hang out and stay away from predators. If you snorkel and you look and see a hole, you'll see a hellbender head sticking out, and that's that guy's home. I mean, he might have that rock as his little home for years and years. They seem to just spend the whole year feeding and doing their own thing. Then around the end of August, early September, all of a sudden, something triggers the males to go completely crazy and they start fighting with each other. Females are drawn to certain rocks that, have, that a male has staked out as the best nesting rock and he'll, he'll defend that rock. You can pretty much imagine that any mountain stream or any, any of the foothill streams throughout their range, throughout the Ohio Valley, Tennessee Valley, up into Pennsylvania, probably had hellbenders in the past. I think it's safe to say that we've probably lost 80 or 90% of the populations that used to be around. I think people are starting to get the connection between some of those healthy fish populations and things like hellbenders, and it is all connected. People care about water quality, whether it's angling, uh, rafting, boating, just swimming and wading. We all want to do that in healthy rivers and streams. Think about that maybe water that you drink someday. So just the focus on healthy watersheds and keeping those streams healthy for, for organisms such as hellbenders. And maybe there's a chance to restore a lot of streams and bring them back to better help under habitat, which means better habitat for everything else that used to be here. Hellbenders are so ugly, but yeah, so amazing. Yeah, you know, you're really lucky if you ever get to see one because so many streams and watersheds have too much sediment and pollution. So hellbender salamanders are no longer able to survive there. Sometimes people enjoy getting outdoors and helping animal species. Let's check in with the class that's been raising trout to release them into streams. We have a group from, you know, Rip Hunt Middle School here in Manassas today. We're at Thompson Wildlife Management Area near Markham, Virginia. And we're on the banks of a little stream here, which is referred to as Wildcat Hollow, which is a tributary of Goose Creek. And it's been improved by the Virginia Department of Fish and Game with some check dams and some deep holes constructed in it to help hold trout. And we've been letting trout go here for six or seven years and trout in the classroom. And they do live here. The Fish and Game Department shocks the stream every year and you know, finds fish from one and two years previous that have been let go here. And it's a great program because these kids who are here today, you can see them behind me, they started with brook trout eggs back in October. They hatched in the classroom and they raised them all during the school year. 
and now they were about three inches long and they were getting their adult coloration starting the show. So during the course of the year, they, they not only learn about the life cycle of the brook trout, they, they maintain the tank, they do the water chemistry testing, and many of the teachers include information on watersheds, cold water environments, some of them get into riparian buffers and stream bank restoration, forestry, wildlife. There's so many ways that it can be tied into the curriculum. And we're just thrilled that so many of the teachers can actually bring their kids out of the classroom for a hands-on experience here on the stream. So the stream is in front of me now. You can't see it, but the kids were there letting their fish go a few minutes ago. And behind me is the macro and vertebrate table where they're looking to make flies and stone flies. And for a lot of the kids, especially in some of the cities in Virginia, because we have big programs in Northern Virginia, Richmond, Roanoke area, some of them never get out of the city. And this is the first time they've ever really been to the country, been out in the woods. And it's just great to see the reaction from them. Some of them are timid, some of them are excited, but most of them have a really good time and we hope they, they learn a little bit and, and appreciate the outdoors and especially the folks out in the cold water environments here. So that was the end of the journey for the class raising those trout, but the beginning of a journey for the little trout fry. Well, where are we headed to now? Downstream, of course. So we've moved down the watershed again, following the water, and the smaller streams have turned into this fast moving river. Yeah. Lots of streams come from publicly managed forests and then run through private property, parks, and towns. There are many places where we can have a positive or negative impact on our watershed, and we need to always be careful not to introduce pollution or invasive species to the watershed. In these larger bodies of water, people can enjoy fishing, kayaking, canoeing, picnicking by the water, and lots of other activities. Some kids are really getting into the swim by snorkeling in freshwater streams. You know, snorkeling is a great way to see all the incredible fish, mussels, and other aquatic animals that only thrive in healthy watersheds. Let's have a look. It was just an eye-opener for me that these kids did not have an appreciation for what was in the water, and the only way we could give them that appreciation was to get them into it. Welcome to the Cherokee National Forest. We're going to have a great day today. Water's going to be good. You're going to see some incredible fish out here, and it's just going to be a lot of fun. It, it was very frustrating to, to really know what was in the river and not be able to really get people to understand it. I could describe it, I could show them pictures, but they just could not grasp what a truly interesting community was down there to be observed. And the only way we could give them that appreciation was to get them into it. We found every year that the same people wanted to come back to see it again. We put probably close to 2,000 people into the river now in the last 12 years to snorkel. All we have to do is just get them in the water and get them asking to snorkel on them. The stream does the rest for us. Anytime we can get a group of kids out here, it's, it's a terrific day. The water can be cold, it can be a little bit cloudy, but they're still going to have a great time in the water. We take them to the next step. First, we get them into the water, which they love anyway. You know? And then when they get to see the fish and, and other animals, it just really makes for a great experience for them. I really like those little red marks that are on it. They're real pretty here. I get so many kids that tell me that it's the most fun thing they did all summer long. You can't help but to become excited when you immerse your body into the water and put your head below the surface and see all these, these things that you never knew were down here. A hot summer day and you put your head in that water and you're surrounded by life and turtles and fish and salamanders and all kind of creatures big and small and colorful and all darting about and it was amazing i mean you're you're in the water with an incredible amount of life i think when people see the great diversity of fish in here they also recognize that the reason they're here why we have all this diversity is because of the clean water. The streams coming off the National Forest, we try to maintain the, the cleanest water we can in them. It's part of our mission. It's part of the reason the Forest Service was, was founded. And by providing that clean water, keeping the, these streams running clean, we're able to maintain the diversity in here. That's so cool to do that. I'm hoping to get my family out again to the forest, or even some parks near my house to take snorkeling gear to see what's under the surface. Yeah. People have always liked being near water, 
and a quick visit to www.discovertheforest.org will help you to find a place near you to go swimming, paddling, fishing, or wildlife watching. Just punch in your zip code, and then the graphic list of cool places will pop up for you. I love using that website. It works everywhere I go, all around the country. I really enjoy being around trees and water, but often there isn't as much tree cover as you move down the watershed into towns and suburban areas. True. Planting trees where you live can be a great way for students and families to get involved in watersheds. Trees really do have a major job. If you want to get an idea of how much a tree's ecosystem services are worth, you can go to the iTree website. Simply by putting in the type of tree you're looking at, its diameter, and then the zip code, because trees behave differently in different places, an iTree will actually give you a dollar value for those ecosystem services. This website will tell you how much rainwater that tree drinks every year and how much carbon that tree is sequestering. It's a simple web-based tool. You know, not all watersheds are the same or look like this one. Let's have a look at a watershed in Colorado. Hi, my name's Dave Winters. I'm a stream ecologist that works with streams, what lives in streams and around streams. And we're currently standing at the Continental Divide at about 12,000 feet elevation on the Pike San Isabel National Forest in Colorado. I'm standing at a very important location in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado called the Continental Divide. And the importance of this Continental Divide, which runs the full length of the country, is it separates this, the water that flows to the eastern part of the country as opposed to the water that flows to the western part of the country. So if I threw a snowball to my left, the water that melted from that snowball is going to eventually end up on the Pacific coast flowing westward. If I threw another one to the east of me, the water that melts from that snowball is going to end up going east and eventually into the Mississippi River and into the Atlantic Ocean. So it's a very important part on the landscape. What we'd like to do today is talk to you about the South Platte watershed that begins right at this elevation, which is about 12,000 feet above sea level. You can see right here, there's a small stream that's coming out of this snowpack that's going east, and there's thousands of these that will come together and form the South Platte River. We've now moved about 1,000 feet in elevation down from the Continental Divide and we're in a very different environment. You can see behind me more water, larger streams, and a wider valley than we had up above us. And this is also a very important part of the South Platte watershed. About tens of thousands of years ago, large glaciers were found in this area that were up to several miles thick because of the elevation and the climate at that time was very cold. As these glaciers melted, they scoured this valley into a very wide, flat dimensions that you see here that are very effective at storing water on the landscape and which is released more slowly down into our river systems. All of those small streams and rivulets that we saw up at the Continental Divide that may have been very narrow now have combined into a much larger stream called the Upper South Platte River. Because of the size of the stream now, we have fish living in the stream. We have much more abundant aquatic insects and uh, other animals that live in the stream. Mink live here, and they all interact together to form animal and plant communities that depend on each other. We're standing at the edge of Terriel Creek at about 8,000 feet, much lower downstream than we were at the Continental Divide. As you can see, there's a lot of water coming down through this stream, and that's a result of all of the water, all the tributaries that came together above and formed this main channel of stream. This waterfall you see behind me is actually the spillway for a reservoir upstream. And as you move down through the South Platte system, 
We also have more reservoirs that are used for water supply, for agriculture, and especially for the cities of Denver and other municipalities along the Front Range. And let's check in with the class learning about the Chesapeake Bay watershed. You guys are going to design, build, and test your own watershed model. Now, since you're going to test the watershed model, we should probably figure out what in the world a watershed is. If you guys look up here at this poster up here, this shows a satellite picture taken from space of our watershed. Can you guys see that white line that surrounds the land there? Yeah. Those show the boundaries of our watershed. So looking at this satellite picture, you guys, what is a watershed? What's a watershed? An yes. area of land that drains into a river system. Oh my goodness, that is a perfect definition. An area of land that drains into a river system or any body of water. So we live in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. For your model, I want your model to have the cleanest water possible coming off of it. You're gonna come up with how you're gonna build this thing. Remember, you want the water to soak in when we add it and you don't want to have any erosion. So think about that as you're building. Soil. All right, guys, I'm gonna give you a little bit. Let's get to Just grab a bunch of stuff. Yeah, we should start with the sand and soil, then the rock. Hmm. Well, let's put this, let's put the mountain down first before you put this. Yeah. Okay. Let me so, get more dirt. We need some leaves. Yeah, mix up the sand and the soil. Yeah, it's so we're going to do a little data analysis. I'm taking a little sample of your runoff. I want you to analyze the data. This is one, two, three, four. Hold up. Which one is the clearest? Hold up a number. Hold up a number. We are analyzing our data. All right, now boys and girls, let's bring it back to the bay. If the water was that turbid, could the little plants at the bottom grow? No. no. If the little plants at the bottom can't grow, do the little fish have anything to eat? No. If the little fish don't have anything to eat, do the big fish have anything to eat? No. And then what about the birds that eat the fish? No. No. So it's all dependent on water quality. Wow. Building your own watershed is a great way to learn about them. That is so cool. So where do we go from here? This is all about the watershed, so downstream. Wow, look at this view. It's amazing that this water started out in the seeps and trickles that we saw earlier. This water has sure traveled a long way and gone through a lot to get here. Yeah, it's quite a different environment from where we started. Cities, with all of their inhabitants, have a high demand for fresh, clean water. I've heard that parts of the country are in a very serious drought. True. Climate change is causing more extreme droughts and having a huge impact on many watersheds across the country and the world. California, for example, has been in a long period of drought that started in 2011. But droughts can happen anywhere in the country. Let's check in with some students in Arizona and see what they did to conserve water. In your bucket is equipment to help you do your experiment. We have uh, new aerators, water efficient aerators. So the kids actually are installing a water savings device and they're going to be able to quantify a water savings that they put in themselves. Um, it's really nice to have a town that's willing to be a part of their education system. I'm more of a hands-on learner, that's how I learn it more. And I think this is easier so that we can visually see it this way instead of just reading it off of a page. And this way we could remember it more and had a fun experience while doing it. <laughs> Arizona is in a drought right now and it's been in a drought for 14 years. So we have to keep conserving water 680? We have got to look at using our water as wisely as, as possible. Yeah. And these kids are gonna know how to do that. Wow. It's inspiring to see students get involved in solutions to problems. They talked about a lot about keeping water as clean as possible as it travels downstream. Sometimes it gets extra help from a water treatment facility. 
let's have a quick tour of this facility just outside the city of Washington, D.C. Hi, my name is Susan Miller. I'm a public information officer at Fairfax Water. We are here at the Frederick P. Griffith Jr. Water Treatment Plant. We have the water coming in from the Occoquan Reservoir. The water comes into the plant. At that point, we call it raw water because it hasn't been treated at all. So the first step in our water treatment process is to add a chemical called coagulant to the water. And what the coagulant does is it acts like a magnet for the dirt. It picks up all the different dirt that's in the water and starts to form larger clumps. And this is where it moves on to the next stage called flocculation. The larger clumps start to keep on binding to each other and form particles called flock. Now as these particles get heavier and heavier, they start to settle down in the water as the water is mixing in the flocculation process. So they will drop to the bottom of the water and this is called the sedimentation process. At this point, all of those flock particles become so heavy that they sink down to the bottom of the basins and the cleaner water is then on top. Next, there's large panels in the bottom of these basins, and those panels slowly move across the floor of the basin, pushing all the sediment out and leaving the clean water on top, which then goes on a kind of a waterfall over a wall to the next step in the process, and this is the ozonation process that it goes to next. At this point, a chemical gas called ozone is added to the water and this ozone filters up through the water with little bubbles going through the water, and those bubbles help to break up uh, any bacteria or dirt that might be remaining in the water. After the ozonation process, it goes to the filter gallery. That's where it goes for filtration. The water flows into clean pools of water that at the bottom has um, a deep layer of carbon, granular activated carbon, and sand. So what the water does is it flows through these pools and sinks through the filter, going out the bottom. The filters with the granular activated carbon have uh, lots of little um, pockets in the carbon, and those help trap any dirt or bacteria that still might be remaining in the water at this point. We do add some more chemicals before the water leaves the plant. We add fluoride to help with tooth protection, and then we add chlorine, which acts as a disinfectant. Um, and this will help keep the water clean as it's traveling throughout your distribution system. So now that the water has the chlorine added, it's clean and ready to go, and we're going to release it out through our mains in our distribution system, and it'll arrive at your tap. We saw that this water started out clean up in the forest. So if we can protect water upstream, then less has to be cleaned downstream in these expensive facilities. That's right. But once this water arrives in suburban and urban areas, there's still a lot of things we can do to keep our water clean because... We all live downstream. <laughs> okay, let's list a few things we can all do to help our watersheds. First, we can start by not using all those plastic water bottles. One of the easiest ways to help the environment is to just to refill your own reusable water bottles in the tap. Yeah, buying water from a store uses a lot of plastic and energy to produce and ship it. Lots of those plastic bottles end up as trash, littering our waterways. One of the main ways is just to keep pollution out of the stormwater drain. You should always correctly dispose of hazardous materials. Never pour contaminants such as oil or pesticides into stormwater drains. Just try to minimize use of chemicals, such as fertilizers on lawns. We've talked about keeping runoff to a minimum. Sometimes people put in a rain garden which is a depression or hole with plants chosen specifically to capture and store rainwater until it can naturally be absorbed into the ground. Others can help with cleanup efforts. They pick up trash along a river, stream, pond, or anywhere else along a waterway. Learning about your watershed and where your water comes from is important so you can be an informed citizen. Some of those citizen science activities, like looking for macroinvertebrates, are fun. It's a great way to learn about the quality of your water. Have you ever heard of a food forest? A food what? A food forest. It's a low maintenance forest planted with edible trees, shrubs, vines, and ground covers. Food forests are a great addition to the urban gardening movement. You really should check them out. We should try to conserve water, even when it seems like we have a lot of it. If we use water wisely at all times, more water will be available for people, plants, and wildlife, even when there isn't a drought. Taking a five-minute shower rather than a 10-minute shower, for example, 
receives 30 to 40 gallons of water a day. Wow. In some places where water is scarce, it's even captured and reused. One way to conserve rainwater is to put a barrel at a downspout. The rainwater that's collected can then be used on your garden or lawn. Let's check in with our friend Melissa Payne, who was with a class that built some rain barrels for a greenhouse at their school. Herman Venegas and some of his neighbors who live in the town of Occoquan began the Friends of the Occoquan organization in 2000. Friends of the Occoquan is an organization of uh, citizens concerned with the preservation of the watershed, especially the Occoquan River. Our main goal has been the water conservation and preservation of the river. We started by cleaning up the river twice a year. Over the years, they have encouraged area schools to help with the cleanup. And now through their water preservation program, they are providing even more valuable lessons to schools. Representatives from the Friends of the Occoquan organization presented a workshop where students made rain barrels to collect water for their greenhouse. The greenhouse at Independent Hill and Pace East School has been a living classroom for many years. Students plant seeds or clippings, and then they have the chance to observe the plant life cycle. Working in the greenhouse is a part of the student vocational program. The vocational program is to get the students ready for when they leave us so that they can be hired on and maintain a job in the community, but also give them life skills so they're not having to have people do everything for them. During the rain barrel workshop, students assembled two rain barrels. They started by drilling holes, then inserted a water faucet. To hold the faucet in place, they attached washers and gaskets on the inside of the barrels. Each barrel can hold up to 55 gallons of water. By collecting their own water, students learn that they can save money by not having to buy water for their greenhouse. Pacey's 10th grader, Artie Anderson. That they help the environment save money and they can help you plant and stuff. Rain barrels can save approximately 1,300 gallons of water during the peak summer months. They also reduce pollution by decreasing the amount of toxins that enter directly into the watershed through stormwater runoff. The next step is for students to not only put their rain barrels to use, but to decorate them in their art classes. Thanks, Melissa. You can save lots of water using a rain barrel. Last but not least, planting trees and shrubs help with all of these suggestions because they conserve water, keep water clean, and minimize runoff. Runoff is water that flows off of parking lots, roads, or other pavement, and it can be a big problem in urban areas. Water that runs off too quickly can cause flooding and other problems. Let's talk a little bit more about runoff and take a look at this graphic from the Arbor Day Foundation because it shows how trees help cities and urban areas deal with runoff. Treeless parking lots are unsightly, add to stormwater runoff, and are a source of heat that's not only uncomfortable, but increases air pollution. Streets without trees deprive the community of social benefits and ecological services. Asphalt playgrounds are unnatural places for children to play, contributing to a disconnect with nature. The solid surface also prevents rain from slowly recharging the groundwater. Treeless homes and yards reduce property values, increase energy costs, and allow rainfall to rush into gutters. Erosion-prone rivers eat away at adjoining property, destroying fish habitat and filling reservoirs and waterways with silt. Compacted lawns without trees are not only less appealing, they often can't soak up heavy rains fast enough. Excessive runoff flows across sidewalks and down driveways and streets. Overwhelmed sewage systems can lead to untreated sewage being swept right into waterways. But trees can make a huge difference on this landscape, as you can see. Well landscaped parking lots can be designed to slow storm runoff and beautify the community. They cool parked cars, reduce evaporated gasoline that contributes to air polluting ozone. Tree shade also adds the longevity to paved surfaces. Tree-lined streets retain large amounts of rainfall. They reduce and cleanse runoff. They can also increase property values, encourage shopping and businesses, reduce air pollution, calm traffic, and lower noise levels. Nature classrooms at schools can be combined with nearby community gardens and natural areas to serve as neighborhood parks. Their unpaid surfaces increase rainwater retention as they provide nature-rich play and learning spaces for children. Shaded homes and tree-filled yards make urban life more pleasant and provide practical benefits such as lower heating and air conditioning costs. The tree canopy is also a major contributor to stormwater runoff reduction. Riparian buffers consisting of trees and shrubs along waterways slow floodwaters, reduce erosion, cool the water for fish, and filter harmful runoff from adjoining lands. 
Rain gardens hold water on site, reducing wasteful runoff and providing moisture for tree roots and flower beds. They also filter chemicals draining from walks, driveways, and streets. Stormwater runoff that is manageable results from abundant trees, multi-use catch basins and rain gardens, reduced impervious surfaces, and increased ground vegetation. The benefits are lower costs and a more livable, sustainable environment. Yeah. What a difference urban and community forestry can make in cities and neighborhoods. So it's been interesting learning more about watersheds from the very top to here in this densely populated area. The New York City watershed is a great example of how important forests are to clean and abundant water. Thanks, Sam Chap, for showing us around. Wait, yo, Della, aren't your friends still waiting on the court? Yes, let's go. Hey guys, what's up? I brought Amchat with me. Man, I didn't know that's where our water came from, and I totally didn't know the impacts about not being more aware about it. Can I try some? Sure. That's good. See, I told you that this water is clean, cool, and fresh. Enjoy it. I'm gonna need more of it after I destroy you guys in the court. We really did just travel from forest to faucet. By now, we've seen that watersheds are really awesome places. They're worthy of our attention and our conservation. Wait, if we're down here at the bottom of the watershed, how do I get back up to the top? Della, how did you do that whole disap... <sighs> Never mind. Hi everybody, this is Terry Heyer. I'm back. I'm going to put up a poll now that has three questions about things that you learned about in the video. So I'm going to pull up that poll right now. Go ahead and start answering them. And when I see that it seems like people are done, I will close the poll. I'm wondering whether you guys are seeing the poll because I don't see anybody answering. Oh, okay, yay, your answers are starting to show up. I'm going to close the poll in 10 seconds. And okay, I'm closing the poll. And it looks like most of you got the answers correct. 3%, only 3% of our Earth's water is fresh, meaning if it's clean enough, we can drink it. So that's why we need to take good care of it. And trees grow 
making new wood each year is true. It's a true statement, but it doesn't really have to do with how trees keep our water clean. They keep our water clean by acting like an umbrella, slowing down the raindrops, acting like a sponge by helping the water soak into the soil and acting as a filter by trapping sediment and other kinds of pollution before it reaches a river. And all of these things you can do on a national forest, hike, camp, fish, and cut down trees for things like paper, wood, and flooring. Well, thank you for taking the time to learn about watersheds today. I hope you enjoyed your journey with AmChat and Della. And contact us if you had any problems viewing the video. You can also go back and watch it at any time at the Children's Water Festival website or on YouTube. So contact us if you had a problem and you'd like to watch the video later on your own time. But thank you for taking the time to learn about how trees are connected to clean water and how the national forests help keep our water clean and produce a lot of clean water. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you everyone for attending the festival and um, you should see an evaluation when the webinar is over, when this class is over. And also as Terry mentioned, be sure to look over some other festival opportunities, either this class recorded on, on and live stream to YouTube. And you can find that maybe most easily by going to the Metro Children's Water Festival webpage and that's metrocwf.org. Um, and there are also some other videos and some uh, lesson plans that you may want to take a look at too. And there's a, a web page called resources on our festival on our on our metro cwf.org um, page. And you're certainly welcome to look at that for some other fun water related education items as well. Um, and Paula, if yeah, if I'm more than willing to answer Harmony's question if you want to unmute her. Sure. Um, one second here and I can do that. I just need to find Harmony's name in the list. Okay. And I'm not seeing it, so I wonder if she has left. And I, I also sent her, I replied to her with my email address that if she wants to email me, she can. Okay, that sounds great. All right. All right, well, thank you all. Thank, thank you, Paula, especially, and Nathan. Thank you all, goodbye.